Good morning, everybody. My name is Brittany. I am the Constituent Relations Coordinator here at APSIA. Um, thank you for joining us today for our PISA Network Advisor webinar on the Scoville, uh, sorry, Scoville Peace Fellowships. Today we have uh, Wind Windilla uh, Balbone with us today yes. um, speaking about the program. Um, I'm so excited to have everyone here because I will be learning very much about this program as well um, at this time. I'm happy to um, pass it over to our speaker. If you would like to introduce yourself in the chat, um, those of you in the audience, I'm happy to um, take questions and see where y'all are all coming from. Thanks, pass it over to you. Yes, thank you, um, Brittany. I'm Windila Balbonet, and uh, I am the program associate of the Scoville Fellowship. I'm also a Scoville alumni, and I was a Scoville fellow in the spring of 2022, where I interned with the Friends Committee on National Just Leg Legislation Education Fund on issues related to peace building and atrocity prevention. Currently, I attend uh, graduate school at Johns Hopkins University in Bologna, so um, it's uh, 7, 8 p.m here and I'm not sure what, what time it is back in the US, but thank you all for coming today. And I hope you all gain a lot from my presentation of the Scoville Fellowship. So um, uh, I'm gonna start with the basic, the goals of the Scoville Fellowship program in general. So one of the goals is to identify promising young scholars and uh, public advocates to provide leadership on the peace and security issues provide a unique professional development experience to outstanding individuals who might otherwise not have had the opportunity to work on the peace and security field in Washington, DC, and uh, connect to existing and future leaders in the peace and security field or uh, related areas of public service. Um, one of the other Herbert Scoville Fellowship goals is to inspire new ideas and create think creative thinking in the critically uh, important work of, of peace and security issues in, honor the legacy of Herbert Scoville GR by encouraging young people to uh, contribute to the field of peace and security in general. The um, uh, host organizations that the fellowship work with are very diverse. We have the Brookings Institute, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Win Without War, Foreign Policy for America, Search for Common Ground, and it all depends on uh, the applicant and the fellow's interest. If the fellow is interested in nuclear weapon, peace building, atrocity prevention, climate, the, all these organizations are open to uh, hosting fellows and providing them the opportunities to learn about the field of peace and security in, in Washington, DC in general. The benefit of the fellow, fellowship, from my personal experience, I believe that the Scoville Fellowship uh, helped me a lot with uh, learning about peace building and atrocity prevention in Washington, DC, because that was my main interest while applying for the fellowship. It enabled me to network, being in Washington DC in the space where so many things are happening. There's briefings, there are hearings, there are experts that you you would meet as a fellow, stay in contact with. Um, you also receive mentorship from uh, the fellowship, from an expert in the specific area that you're interested in, and an alumni of the program who uh, graduated or work in a specific field that you might be interested in as well. So mentors help you through the fellowship, professional development, um, or any um, interests or issues related to your work, your daily life, and even personal sometimes, because moving to a new city such as Washington DC for many of us can be um, hard and uh, having a system that is there to help you navigate the city of Washington, it can be very helpful when you, uh, you're moving there first. Those fellowship also provide our um, more salary expert meetings every month. And the uh, fellows are enabled to pick three to four experts that they are interested in, that they want to hear from for a meeting in general. And these meetings are usually very uh, more intimate and uh, in small groups of students and fellows in general, four to five fellows. And you get to ask many questions that you want, questions about their personal lives questions about their career path and what led them to that specific career path and uh, how they can guide and help you in general in your own trajectory. So um, I'm now gonna talk about the selection criteria for the application process. 
So um, the fellowship in general uh, looks for students and applicants who have prior experiences in pub with public interest activism or advocacy is highly, highly de desirable. Um, experience with public interest activism or advocacy demonstrate excellent academic accomplishment and a strong interest in issues of peace and security in general. Um, um, candidates are also required to have completed uh, a baccalaureate degree by the end of the fellowship and um, or have a, a master's degree, either one work for the fellowship. Though there's preference for US citizens, but the fellowship also um, uh, provide awards or periodically or uh, the fellowship to all uh, residents, permanent resident of the United States. I'm now gonna talk about uh, eligibility for the fellowship. I'll receive a bachelor or master's degree within the past few years, which I've mentioned in the previous slide. Um, have a background and strong interest in uh, uh, one of the policy issues the fellowship focuses on, which are nuclear weapon, peace building, climate, and uh, many other issues. Ac excellent academic accomplishment, good writing and oral communication skills, because um, a lot of the fellows write and publish op-eds, articles around the issues they're interested in at their different um, host organizations. So how to apply for the fellowship? Um, once you go to the fellowship website in general, there's um, a, a how to apply tab where you go and uh, basically learn about the application requirement, items that you need for the application. And usually it's um, a formulaire where you have to complete your name, addresses, and then another one for personal essay, a policy essay, transcript, and uh, two letters of recommendation. I uh, recommend asking the um, letters of, rec of recommendation at least three weeks earlier because most of the time we um, struggle with getting the letters of rec recommendation and when we don't have them, it's hard to process with reviewing the application process. Um, uh, policy essay, the policy essay is surrounding the same topic, the climate, peace building, atrocity prevention, um, um, nuclear non-proliferation in general, and uh, the candidate can write about any of these topics that they're interested in. And the topic is, the question is basically, um, what's the most threatening um, problem or issue to peace and security across the world? And the personal essay is almost like uh, an interest essay um, uh, where the candidate can share more about their experiences in undergrad, graduate school, their professional experiences that prepare them for the fellowship and that makes them an excellent candidate for the Scoville Fellowship. Oh, uh, one of the benefits again. Um, uh, what do fellows do? Many fellows at their host organization write op-eds, assessments of countries. Um, they work on projects at their host organizations. They collaborate with different teams at their host organizations. Um, or they do outreach advocacy. Some of them are able to uh, do some lobby and uh, some host organization will not enable you to do some lobby. It all, all depends on the specific host organization that you end up at. There's opportunities for research on the issue that you're interested in. And a lot of the fellow attend briefings, hearings at the State Department, um, in Congress, and uh, some host organization even hosts almost uh, speakers where fellows can now get to interact with them as well. For the upcoming application date and deadline for the fall or um, 2024 application, it will open, the deadline is January 8th and the application will open um, uh, in uh, December 15th. For the starting date for the fall fellowship, fellows can start between July 15th and October 1st. Any date uh, between July 15 and October 1st works for um, uh, the applicant of, with the fellowship. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at uh, info at scoville.org or wbalbone at scoville.org. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I don't see any questions in the um, chat function. So if y'all have any for our speaker, please do feel free to drop them in there. 
I'm happy to get us started with Q&A from the preliminary questions we have from the registration form, if that's okay. Yes. Great. So the first question I have for you is, how can students from small liberal arts colleges be successful in their application like this one? Thank you for the, this question. Um, I myself, I went to a SUNY school upstate New York, a very small school. I would say um, uh, making sure that your letter of recommendations come in earlier and that you are talking to the professors, for example, that know you best, that know your work in your classroom, outside of the classroom that can speak really well of you and your experiences in general. I would say when it comes to the policy essay, um, uh, focusing on uh, the specific topic that you're interested in and making sure that the reviewers can see why you believe that this uh, topic is the most um, uh, threatening issue to international peace and security around the world. It's almost like um, uh, a notepad where you're, you have a thesis and you're arguing why this is really important. So making sure that you're using strong evidences to uh, support your thesis basically will be very helpful in the application process. And uh, for your letter of, uh, letter of interest in general, the reviewers wanna see that this candidate is prepared for the fellowship. They're prepared for the next step. Um, or they have experience that shaped um, uh, their interest in the specific topic of climate change, for example. They've uh, worked with this organization that prepared them for the fellowship. Uh, they actually aspire to work in the future in the field of climate change or peace building. And the fellowship is gonna benefit them by providing that network in Washington, DC to get to where they wanna, wanna be. So you start with, these are the experiences I have. I hope to gain this from the fellowship and I hope to do this in the future based on what I will gain from the fellowship. That's really good advice, especially that last piece um, framing. We agree that lots of students should be framing their story as where they've been, where they are now and where they want to be and how your program will, or not will, fits into that vision, right? Yes, yeah. Right. Um, going back to your um, letter of uh, recommendations, can you clarify if uh, both of the recommenders need to be academic or do you also think that having a professional reference is um, beneficial as well? Um, the letters don't all have to be um, from uh, an academic, academic professor. One of them can be an academic professor and the other one can be uh, from a professional uh, setting in general. So uh, I will recommend most of the time to have one from a professional setting and one the other one from an, an academic setting. That shows that you have, you're diverse, you have uh, the diverse experiences and it's not only academically. So. Right, what a good way to show the breadth of your, or like, your range, I guess. Yes. Um, the other question I have in the chat function is, are finalists interviewed? So um, yes, finalists are interviewed. Finalists are usually notified about one month or three, three to one month after the application process. And uh, they each go through uh, an interview process. First, they, the fellowship will, con will put you in contact with uh, alumni so you can learn about the interview process. So what, happens when you get the fellowship, how to prepare for the fellowship, how to choose your host organization. So we prepare you through the whole process and basically each uh, finalist will have an interview with uh, at least seven to eight board members, depending on how many board members are available that day for the interview. And uh, the same day you will find out if you got the fellowship or not. Wow. Um, For an undergraduate student, that might seem a little daunting, but obviously doable. What would you say, or what is your advice for students to prepare or not feel so much pressure about the experience? Um, I would say I, I personally applied um, the same year I graduated from uh, under, undergrad. So um, I did internships over summers when I was an undergrad, but still, 
I completely understand the pressure because many students and many applicants finished um, undergrad, they had jobs before applying, but the fellowship is looking for a diverse pool of applicants. We're not focusing only on people who have professional experience after college. We're looking at people who really want to learn from DC and we're looking at people who will not have the experience or the opportunity to do that if it wasn't for the fellowship. So we're looking at diverse uh, pool of applicants. So even if you're an undergrad student about to graduate, I would encourage applying because you just never know. I was under the pressure as well and questioned myself a lot, but I'm glad I applied and I'm glad I um, uh, still decided to apply. So yes. Right. The worst they can say is no. Yes. <laughs> um, alrighty. Next question I have for you is are certain majors more appropriate than others for your fellowship? So um the fellowship is looking at the different topics areas are climate change, um, peace building, nuclear non-proliferation, um health as well. So um, anything related to these different fields, political science, international relations, um, even if you have not majored in political science and international relations or health related um, or topic, but in your internships, for example, you've had experience working with these different organizations. So you still have that experience and you're still, um, I guess, eligible for the application process because we're not looking only at your major, we're looking at your overall experience. Where have you worked? What have you interned in? What did, did you advocate about in general, in your community in general? So they should still apply and uh, put that chance forward. I agree. Um, following up on that question, um, the other one is, is language proficiency required in, in a second language? Um, it, it is. It's not required, but it's definitely helpful because when it comes to working in the field of international peace and security in general, it's always um, uh, helpful when you speak an additional language because if you're interested in uh, the, the Asian program, for example, in the Nuclear Threat Initiative program, you might want to learn a little bit of Chinese or Japanese or understand some few words in the language, but it's not required. I personally did not need um, any French or any other languages when I worked at the French Committee on National Legislation. And uh, I will say it's uh, it's not necessarily, it's helpful, but it's not required to have a second language. It's all about learning and uh, it's open to people that actually want to learn and be part of the peace and security field in Washington, D.C. And in the process, you're also learning. Okay, let's see. In the chat function, I see um, how far out from the um, a bachelor's degree can someone apply for this fellowship? Oh, how far out from the bachelor's degree can someone apply for the fellowship? Um, we don't have any specific uh, number of years from bachelor's degree. I've known people who've applied or um, more. 10 years after um, graduating, people who are in their me 30s or 40s who've applied for the fellowship. So we don't have any specific requirement when it comes to that. As long as you have a bachelor degree or graduate degree, you're, you can apply for the fellowship and the experiences as well. You can apply for the fellowship. I'm sure our advisors are loving to hear this right now. Um, before I jump into the next question, I want to encourage um, our advisors to go ahead and raise their hands if they want to ask a question themselves. I um, want this to be an open conversation, um, but I'm happy to read the questions out loud as well. Are you able to hear me? Um, there's a little bit of background noise in the background. I just want to make sure you can. Thank you. Okay, Lindsay's next question is... Is Scoville looking for student researchers in these fields or for active participation in these topics in their candidate profile? So um, uh, the Scoville Fellowship, is, it's, not, it's not a research fellowship, but um, uh, students who might be interested in like doing research can also do that as well because the fellowship has a requirement where students or applicants in general have to 
complete an assessment or project while working at the host organization. So if a student was interested in the Ukraine conflict, for example, or the DRC or Russia in general, they can do research and write an assessment about Russia or projects generally about Russia. So it's not a research funded uh, fellowship, but there's still the opportunity to do research on a specific topic. And uh, fellows that work on this host organization, uh, I guess a little bit, different from other fellows because you are flexible to choose any topics that you're interested in because you are uh you're almost considered as an as a contractor because the host organization doesn't pay you directly it's whoever that pays you so you have the opportunity to choose any topic that you're interested in and uh, if your i guess supervisor is working on something interesting that you want to jump in you can ask them can i jump into this project can i work on this project so that's something that i really uh find found great um kathleen question for you is does pro or does scoville provide any assistance in finding temporary and affordable housing that's that's a great question um uh, so Scoville uh, covers travel or um, expensive when the fellow is moving to Washington DC, for example, up to uh, 400. Uh, but when it comes to finding housing, sadly, you have to take care of that on your own. But usually before the fellow even start, we set up meetings with um, uh, alumni and other fellows who are already in Washington DC. And these meetings are very helpful. When I was moving to Washington DC for my fellowship, uh, the fellows really helped me find housing. They went to different places and looked at the places for me to see if it was um, something that would fit what I actually wanted. So we don't provide that, but through the interactions and connections with fellows and alumni in general, that's still that network to help you uh, accommodate to Washington, D.C. to find an affordable place. And uh, in Facebook, Facebook market in general, social media, it's easy to find housing there because there's always people moving out and in of DC, out in and outside of DC. Great, thank you. Um, it seems that the community piece of Scoville is a big factor in helping students setting, yes. up, um, setting themselves up in DC. Love to hear it. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat function, but I did have a question of my own while we wait for others to trickle in or weigh in. Um, my question is, what do you wish you knew before applying for Scoville? What, um, and what would you have done to improve your experience? Um, so um before applying for the fellowship i wish i i didn't stress so much about the application process or doubt myself um, so i would recommend or encourage anyone that's interested to go ahead and just apply because as you said it earlier what's the worst that can happen just to know i would say i wish i um uh, I guess sent in my letters of recommendations earlier because that um was initial towards my application process because I was missing some letters of recommendation, sending that earlier. And having um uh, other people review your essays in general just to give you feedbacks, grammar feedbacks or um uh, or to grammar in gen in general. So these are the I guess two things I would say I wish I knew. But anything else? I, I just went ahead and, and applied for the fellowship and it worked out, yeah. Great. Um, I am not seeing any other questions in the chat. Did anybody want to weigh in? If not, um, would you like to give any final remarks about um, your presentation, the fellowship, just anything we may have missed. Um, yeah. Before we jump into that. Um, okay. I think there's a few questions in yes, the chat. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so um, once a student is uh, accepted as a fellow, they don't need to apply for the host organization. 
the host organizations are already aware that they will be hosting um, potential fellows at each one of their organizations. So we usually set um, uh, meetings with different host organizations. So fellows are required to pick three different organizations that they are interested in, set up a meeting with them, an informational meeting basically to get to know their supervisor, potential supervisors, what kind of issues they would be working on, basically to see if uh, the space is suitable for the fellow and if uh, the fellow is a good fit for the organization as well. And right after that, you will rank your uh, top choices based on the organization that you choose. And uh, the host organization also rank their top three fellows. And if they, if it's a match, basically you work with that specific organization. So no fellow needs to apply for the organizations right after they get the fellowship. Cool. The following question is, was there anything you would have done differently to take better advantage of your fellowship? Um, I would say definitely networking. I, at the beginning of the fellowship, I did network a lot. I'll, there's always happy hours going on around DC on different topics, different uh, organization happy hours. I did attend numerous of them towards the beginning, but I would recommend tell anyone to take advantage of these opportunities. And when you reach out to, when you meet people, you always make sure to reach out later to ask for a coffee, coffee, for example, go for a coffee, learn about what they're working on. They can connect you to someone else that might have the same interest as you. So I would say taking advantage of the networking opportunities is, is really important because that's what the fellowship really sets you for. It opens the doors for networking, you might you, know, you never know you might find your other job without job after the fellowship too or that networking opportunity so networking there's a professional development stipend as well um that's a one thousand professional development stipend for any thing the, the fellow might be interested in it can be in a conference in a different city a conference in washington dc a language class or a training that the fellow might be interested in taking. So thinking about what they want to do with the stipend towards the beginning is really important because some of the fellows find themselves towards the end and they don't, they still haven't decided on what they want to use the 1000 stipend on. So that as well. Right. Wow. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Okay. Um, some following questions I see. Um, aside from this fellowship, what are some additional good entry points for undergrads who work in this field slash think tanks? Um, I would say um, other fellowships that I know personally is the, there are few state departments fellowships such as the Pickering Foreign Affairs Fellowship. There's uh, the Wrangell uh, Fellowship as well. And there's one with USAID for international development. I recommend these fellowships because they fund graduate school and uh, they provide two internships, one overseas and one domestic internship for fellows. But that's mainly for fellows who are interested in uh, working with the State Department as uh, foreign service officers and diplomats in general. So if anyone is interested in that, I would recommend applying for these fellowships. But there's always... Uh, or scholarships and uh, fellowships on these different um, uh, host organizations website that they promote every time. So looking into the different uh, host organizations website to see if there's any um, uh, fellowship opportunities, internship, paid internship in general is definitely helpful. Great, thank you. Um, back to um, the Scoville Fellowship. Um, what was your time commitment uh, in a regular week, like Monday to Friday? So with the fe with the fellowship, it's a full time commitment basically. Monday to Friday, or uh, nine to five. Some host organization will ask for a nine to five thirty basis, but um, it depends on which organization you end up working with. So mine was specifically nine to five thirty, and if uh, the fellowship had any other um, uh, opportunity or event going on, I will attend them as well, but it wasn't a requirement for me. So it was uh, 9 to 5.30 and Monday to Friday. Um, thank you. Um, I know you said it really depends on the organization and what works best for them and you, right? Um, 
in your experience, are you seeing that organizations are still in a hybrid work model or um, they've gone back to a fully in-person experience? So many of the organizations um, are slowly moving to a, a full in-person experience. I personally did my fellowship uh, hybrid. I was three times uh, in the office and twice at home. So um, uh, now it seems like more of the organizations are moving completely to in-person mode. So if the, anyone is interested in applying for a fellowship, I think it's uh, it might be mandatory to move to Washington, D.C. I know a few fellows who had theirs completely remote in 2022, but that is slowly changing with a lot of organizations. Great. Um, yes, keeping in mind that it depends on the individual organization. Um, great. I am not seeing any other questions. So at this time, I would love to pass it over to our speaker for any final remarks. Um, and then I will go ahead and close out the call. Thank you so much for uh, coming to this presentation again. I will uh, just say to tell your students to apply to this fellowship because um, if I am here attending graduate school today at Johns Hopkins University and uh, so many of my networking opportunities came from this fellowship or uh, my letters of recommendations that I've had came from this fellowship and the people that I've met through the fellowship. I've learned a lot about the people security field that I've probably would have never had this opportunity if it wasn't because of the uh, Scoville Fellowship coming from my specific background. So um, the fellowship is open to anyone. Go ahead and apply. You just you just never know. So it's... thank you again. Thank you. Um, and thank you for everybody or to everybody who joined us today for this webinar. It is the last one of 2023. So um, I'm happy you all got to join us. And I'm looking forward to seeing um, what webinars we have lined up next year. Uh, thank you so much. I'm gonna end the call. Uh...